namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa we should uh, often remember that <coughs> The Buddha's teaching, the essence of the Buddha's teaching is two things, the nature of suffering and the end of suffering. As the Buddha said, uh, all I teach is suffering and the end of suffering. So his teaching is always uh, <coughs> practical and pragmatic, uh, uh, trying to uh, help human beings. Uh, <clears throat> there are different ways in which we suffer. But a great deal of the suffering that human beings uh, endure is self-inflicted. Uh, we, we can suffer a great deal from our own internal mental states. <clears throat> and this is a, a kind of suffering that in the last analysis is actually entirely optional. You know, we don't have to suffer because of our internal mental states if we uh, approach things properly. But beings do suffer a great deal from sadness, from anger, from uh, anxiety and fear. And all these things can be very painful. As a category, we could call them uh, the uh, negative emotions. When uh, we are... Uh, in, experiencing any of these kind of mental states uh, it's it's very unpleasant and it seems like it's not really within our volition it's not within our control we have to learn to uh, work to uh, understand them and to liberate ourselves from it's not something we can be free of just by wishing. The first step is always to be conscious of what is happening in our uh, uh, mental stream and not to uh, suppress and refuse to look at any uh, internal reality, but to acknowledge it and here it is. But being conscious of it is only a first step. And it, being conscious of a state like anger or despair is not to wallow in it or to uh, validate it or to give it, uh, to acknowledge it as important. We have to learn to not take ownership of it. The principle of not me, not mine. When anger arises, for example, it doesn't mean that I am angry or I am an angry person. It means here is anger. Anger is a mental state. It is known by consciousness. It's not what defines you as a, as a being. And the same with all the other emotions. Anger is never useful or positive. It's always uh, 
disruptive and uh, makes you less effective in anything you uh, you're trying to do. That's also the principle that you need to take responsibility for your own mental states. You're not going to get anywhere if you blame them on external circumstances or other people. Say, this person makes me angry, I can't help it. Which doesn't mean, not giving way to anger doesn't mean uh, being, uh, making yourself into a victim or a pushover. There are circumstances that arise in life where you need to stand up for yourself and your, uh, set your boundaries. Um, these, uh, these situations are uh, more skillfully handled if it can be done with equanimity and wisdom without giving way to anger, to, to have a clarity about the situation and to deal with it in a skillful and appropriate manner. There's also a whole range of uh, feelings and of the unpleasant variety that are classed as dominasa or unpleasant uh, vedana, feeling tone, you know, all the way from feeling a little, uh, little sad to uh, major despair and depression. This is all uh, the uh, unhappy vedana, unpleasant vedana. It's uh, one thing we can see from study of Abhidhamma is that unpleasant Vedana never arises with a skillful or kusala uh, mind state. It's always associated with unskillful mind states, meaning it's never spiritually positive to feel sad or down. Happiness, on the other hand, is uh, can be very positive. It's um, uh, listed as one of the enlightenment factors. When we talk about the three three grades of happiness. Happiness that arises from sense objects, happiness that arises from jhana, and the happiness associated with the transcendence, the realization of nirvana. Happiness that arises from sense objects is the uh, least, the lowest grade, it's still happiness, but it's ephemeral because it's dependent on externalities. And that impermanence of the externalities, the object is lost and the happiness can turn to sadness. The happiness arising from jhana has been called by the Buddha, uh, the happiness that is blameless and is separated from the senses. So it's entirely internally generated not dependent on external causes. And the happiness of Nirvana is beyond, it's only really called happiness figuratively, it's beyond anything we can conceive of. But sadness is never associated with any of these uh, positive states. And it, like all the afflictive emotions, it, it uh, feels bad, it's unpleasant to experience it. 
and we uh, need to again first recognize that it's present, and then not but not take ownership of it, not me, not mine. To see it as a dependently arisen state, impermanent, not a defining characteristic of your of your being. One form this can take is remorse and regret when the mind goes into the past and dwells on things done or said long ago. And everybody in their life has made uh, mistakes and done wrong things. And it's, it's, it's skillful to accept that, acknowledge it, and take it as a lesson learned but it's not skillful to dwell on it and to beat yourself up over it, to feel, to feel bad in the present because of what happened in the past. Remember that the past is no longer existent, it's no longer real. And it's unskillful to dwell on uh, negative things in the past. One of the meditations in the uh, Vasudhi Maga is contemplation of virtue, which is the opposite of this, is uh, recalling to mind and bringing forth to consciousness the good things you have done, the meritorious things, <clears throat> and rejoicing in it. It seems that uh, human beings have some uh, a perverse nature in which we seem to like to lick our old wounds and go back into the past and dwell on negativity. And that's unskillful and it doesn't, it doesn't aid our growth. But if, if we do go the other way and recall to mind our virtues, then that is positive because we can build on that. Fear is an especially harmful emotion to give, give into fear, to give way to fear. It's also never, never useful. It's to be distinguished from a clear, rational recognition of, of uh, present dangers and um, sensibly avoiding them. That's not fear. Fear tends to uh, paralyze. It's like the, uh, the classic uh, image of the deer in the headlights. We can be debilitated by fear. And the Buddha said that uh, fear is one of the factors that makes uh, for bad decisions. A decision based on fear, an action taken out of fear, is, is going to be uh, often wrong. But an action taken with a clear recognition of potential dangers and avoidance of potential dangers is got a rational analysis of risk that's sensible but fear is just is an irrational response the arahant is said to be one one of the characteristics of an arahant is to be totally beyond fear this is the state of abaya the fearlessness Also, in dealing with fear, the Buddhist gave some specific advice. He said that uh, if fear arises while sitting, one should remain sitting until the fear passes. If it arises while walking, one should continue walking until the fear passes. So this can be interpreted both literally and uh, metaphorically. Literally, if you're practicing meditation and 
you find yourself falling into fear, don't try and run away from it by changing postures. You know, work through it, come to the other side of it. But also metaphorically, just internally, don't run away from from the fear, but face it now, come through to the other side. There's a saying that someone came up with, uh, the way out is down and through. This is uh, analogous to the to mythical um, uh, trope of uh, the ogre on the on the bridge or the dragon guarding the horde. Some fearsome to get a, a prize, uh, some fearsome thing has to be faced down. And this uh, this happens in meditation. It's one of the recognized stages of the Vipassana path. It's the knowledge of fearfulness, because when uh, a yogi has seen the true nature of samsara and has seen uh, impermanence and particularly, but also the suffering and, and emptiness. It's like the illusions have been, the comforting illusions have been stripped away. And one is facing the naked reality of everything falling apart, and breaking up, and nothing can be depended on. And this can be fearful until one gets through to the other side. One has to, have, this is where uh, faith and courage come into play. One has to have faith that there is another side. And one has to summon up the courage and determination to, to uh, go through it. And again, changing postures, running away, only prolongs that, that state of mind. The spiritual path requires Virtues like kindness and gentleness and metta, loving kindness, but it also requires some ferocity, internal ferocity, a kind of warrior spirit to get to uh, overcome the obstacles. <clears throat> Anxiety is another. Related to fear, anxiety is another state of mind that is, is actually specifically classed as one of the hindrances to uh, unifying the mind. And just as remorse is running back into the past, poking at old wounds, anxiety is jumping forward into the future and dwelling on possible scenarios that are, are uh, threatening and it just as going into the past is useless going into the future is useless so nothing is accomplished by being anxious or worrying in the present moment if the mind is absolutely seated in the present moment there's no uh, there's no anxiety there's no fear there's no uh, remorse And it's actually the case that uh, bliss is a more natural, a more primordial state of mind than is uh, fear or anxiety or sadness. When these things are not present, the mind naturally goes to a more luminous and blissful state of being. higher even than bliss is equanimity, uh, profound peacefulness. Equanimity is an, 
is classed as a, as a Vedana, but it also has it also can manifest as a Sankara. It's a, it has different contexts. Um, the word is used in, in many different contexts. The simplest rudimentary form of upeka is mutual feeling, and it's not particularly spiritually elevated at that level. It's just a simple neutrality. Things are neither pleasant nor painful, they're just neutral. And it's probably the most common of the feeling tones. But as a uh, developed spiritual state, it, uh, Vedana is a profound uh, peacefulness. It's, it's called uh, Sukham Param Sukham, the bliss beyond bliss. And it's the uh, feeling tone of fourth jhana. And in the Vipassana path, it's the state that's reached uh, when one has overcome uh, the fearfulness and uh, uh, despair and all the negative states that can arise and has seen through them and come to the other side. There's a state that's called equanimity of formations, which is profoundly peaceful. And there's no feeling at that time that you're actually making an effort, but the meditation is flawless. It just carries on at its own uh, steam. And it's a quite a wonderful state of mind to, to sit in. But it's not yet full, uh, full awakening. But it's the only state from which awakening can occur, and there's no effort required at that stage. No, no effort will actually bear fruit. You just have to sit and, and wait. So, you know, returning to the theme of uh, dealing with the negative emotions, let's say that um, emotional states are an integral part of our, our being, uh, of our, our psyche. And we need to uh, understand them, recognize them, and to uh, classify them as skillful and unskillful. The skillful emotions are, first of all, the brahma of hearts, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity are always skillful. And the Buddha said the wise person always dwells in the brahma of hearts. The feeling tone of happiness can be skillful, depending on the object but it's uh, brightening and uplifting to the mind. So it's not that emotions themselves or are, are anything, anything wrong with that. They're, it's natural. And even the negative emotions, we're never going to be free from them until, completely until we're arahants. But we can... Uh, refuse to be bound by them, to be controlled or crippled by them, by not taking ownership of them. The way that Thai forest tradition talks about doing this is always to fall back on the chitta, the knowing mind, the clear knowing. Because the knowing mind, the citta, is so intrinsically pure that it's it's not affected by any of these states. It, it knows them as objects.
So residing in the chitta, which Ajahn Mahabhuru called your true home, abiding in the chitta is like sitting in a nice cozy cabin with the wood stove going when there's a raging blizzard outside. So there might be all kinds of mental states arising, but the chitta is not affected. It knows them, it looks out the window, knows there's a blizzard, but it doesn't feel the sting of the wind or the, the, the cold. But if you give in to the emotions and you take ownership of them and, and wallow in them, that's like going outside and walking out into the blizzard. And remember also that the, the, the characteristics apply to the emotional states. The three char characteristics, the tilakana, they are obviously dukkha, they're obviously uh, unsatisfying and, and suffering. But you can also take comfort in the fact that they're impermanent. This too shall pass. So the fact of impermanence applied to unpleasant states is like a, a, a relief. And you can recall this, this too shall pass. This is impermanent. This is not a permanent state of being. And most importantly, to, to see the insubstantiality, the un, unreality, the emptiness of mental states. There's really nothing there. You can be overwhelmed with a mental state of despair or, or raging anger. But if you look at it with a clear eye of wisdom, you see it's empty. There's nothing there. It's insubstantial. It has no mass. It has no no volume. It cannot be located in space. It's completely empty. It's unreal. Why should I let this afflict me? Why should I let something utterly empty and so insubstantial have any effect on me? And also the work on encouraging the, the, the positive states or find occasions to bring joy into the mind. You can appreciate the, the beauties of nature and take joy in, the, in this wonderful uh, experience of the life on this planet. And bring up the uh, emotions of uh, metta, uh, loving kindness or benevolence, and feeling warm good-heartedness towards other beings. May these beings be well and happy. And have compassion or karuna for their suffering and mudita rejoicing in their well-being if you, if you see beings human or animal or otherwise enjoying their existence you know, rejoice in that And finally, upeka, or equanimity. To try and cultivate that sense of being at, at ease and at peace. And whatever the external circumstances, internally, be well-centered, be bright and clear and at peace. And not only, if you cultivate these positive emotions and work to diminish the negative ones, not only will you be happier, brighter, and moves you along in the spiritual path, 
but you'll be more effective in your life at anything you do. You, you'll be a lot more pleasant as a person to be around. So your social relations will improve. Nobody enjoys hanging around with grumpy people or miserable people. Like the, the cheerful, kind-hearted. That's a way, so it's a, it diminishes suffering in all ways, from the most mundane to uh, leading towards uh, full awakening and enlightenment, realization. I'll stop there.